you please forgive us for our sins that that uh, we will be able to hear whatever lessons and truths that, that you want to communicate to us through the Holy Spirit. I ask that you first forgive me of my sins, Lord, that that Jesus will be seen and not me, that, that Christ and Him crucified will be the main message that comes out. And I ask for your angels to occupy this sanctuary and, and that your spirit will occupy all of our hearts, that the forces of evil will have no room to pester us during this study. Please be with us, Lord, and help us to understand just how important knowing your name is and how important you knowing our name is. Be with us, Lord, please, in your name, amen. So, will he know your name? It's a question I think we all need to consider. And the reason I believe we need to consider it is because of the text that we will be reading here momentarily. Um, there are few sermons that I have put together that carried with it the, the, the drive that God has laid on my heart to put messages like this together. Usually I'll put a message together and people will say, hey, that was good, that was, that was a good study, things like that. And, but few are the ones where I, I feel such a weight of conviction to put it together. And this is one of those. You see, I have a burden for our church. God has called us and gifted us each with different ministries. There are many in this congregation who go out and seek people outside of the church to bring them in. But the main burden of my heart that I believe God has given me is to wake up our church, to preach the present truth. Um, and, and I pray that I present it in a godly way because sometimes some people don't. Um, we are told that a peaceful testimony will not arouse God's people. It's got to be present truth. It's got to be the hard truth. And it's got to attack the sins that we cherish the most. But even so, my main desire is for Christ and him crucified to come through, even in the hard stuff. So will he know your name? If you would, you can pay attention to the screen or you can open to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to begin in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now that's, that's pretty straightforward. Jesus is saying, you follow me, you'll make it. You don't follow me, you won't. But he gets into a little more detail. You see, during the what I call the executive phase of the judgment, when the wicked are being punished. Jesus is describing uh, uh, what's going to happen. He's going to say, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? Now, let me ask you a question here. Who is Jesus talking about here? The lost, but, but specifically which category? Are, are these wicked worldlings? This is the church, right? Professed believers who find themselves in the fires of hell, in the lake of fire. And Jesus, notice his response. He says, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You that work, what? Iniquity. You know, the great controversy says that the great sin of the Jews was what? Do you remember that quote? Not believing, Christ. Not believing in Jesus. Rejecting their Messiah. And the great sin of the Christian church is what? Rejecting the law. Rejecting the law. Now, don't think that just because you're sitting here in an Adventist church that you're secure because you believe in all Ten Commandments. You see, we can break the law in our hearts just as easily as with our hands. In fact, it starts in our hearts. Eve sinned before she ever touched that fruit. So, I want to point something out here. The word for name comes from Strong's G3686. This is New Testament, so it's Greek. And it does mean name, but more importantly than that, it means authority, character. The, the name is used for everything which the name covers. Everything the thought or feeling of which is aroused in the mind by mentioning. So, 
Uh, let's, let's do a little example here. What kind of feelings do you feel if I say Ernesto Illingworth? Give me some examples. Talk to me. I have a great like for him. Okay. Okay. Now, let me ask you a different example. What if I say Adolf Hitler? No respect. Okay. So, everything that you feel when you hear someone's name, that's what this word means. It's what, one of the things that it refers to. Um, and so, with that in mind, let's read verse 22 again. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? name or character or authority or whatever people feel when they hear the name of Jesus. Not everybody, when they hear the name of Jesus, is happy to hear that name. And, and, and forget about Satan and his demons for just a moment here. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people. I've come in contact with plenty of people, at least online, when they hear the name of Jesus. Oh, my goodness, they come out with pitchforks and torches. They, they would tar and feather you alive if they could. And, and, and so, and it's not just because they believe in science over the Bible. It's because there are many of us Christians who we claim the name of Jesus in church and we walk out that door and we live like worldlings. I'm not a big fan of like Christian contemporary music. It sounds too worldly for me, but there's a song called... Uh, what if I stumble by an old group, well, old now, called a DC Talk. I grew up with them on their music. And in the intro to that song, it says the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but they walk out that door and they deny him with their lifestyle. And so Jesus is talking to these people. This is the lake of fire, and he's talking to these professed Christians, and he's like, look, I don't know you. You claimed to do this with my authority, but I wasn't there. You claimed to do this with my character, but I don't do those things. And because of you, Jesus is saying, many people rejected me because you didn't act like me. So who will go to heaven then? Let's talk about that. The Bible says those who do the will of God. Well, that's simple enough. But if our study ended there, this would be a very short sermon. So, what does the Bible say is the will of God? Let's look at a few texts, and for the sake of time, we're going to kind of speed through these a little bit, um, just because I have the tendency of running a little long. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 says, The will of God is your sanctification. So, sanctification is the process of what? Being set apart, of becoming holy, right? Um, now, Paul tacks on here that you should abstain from fornication. So, in many cultures back then, sexual immorality was a huge problem, just like it is in American culture today and in many others. But it's not just, uh, you know, physical fornication. It's spiritual as well. The Bible also says in, in the next chapter in 1 Thessalonians 5, and the very God of peace sanctify you what? Holy. Uh, and I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul also goes, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God. You know, I, I have a problem, I, you know, that sometimes I focus too much on the negative, and Paul saying here is, don't do that, focus on the positive, thank God in everything. He doesn't say thank God for everything, I, I, you know. Uh, but he says, thank God in everything. Keep that attitude of praise. The Bible calls it a sacrifice of praise for a reason. Because sometimes we don't want to do it. And what really pleases God is when we give him that sacrifice of praise, even especially when we don't feel like it. Paul continues and says, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. So there are many within the church who despise the gift of prophecy we've been given. Paul's saying, don't, don't do that. The will of God is that you don't do that. He says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Abstain from every appearance of evil. So he has a list here of, of different things. Uh, and this verse could in and of itself be its own sermon. 
in First First Timothy two rather. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, um, one of the lessons that we need to learn that I think children, especially you know, one of the lessons we're trying to teach ours is we don't always get our way. And even God doesn't always get his way because he doesn't force it, right? So this verse is saying that the will of God is that everybody will be saved. But the Bible also tells us that not everybody is, is going to be saved. But God's will is to give everybody the chance. He's going to give us all the opportunity to be saved because here soon, uh, as soon as things heat up enough, God will pour out the latter rain and the Holy Spirit in latter rain power. Everybody will hear the message. In Luke 9, Jesus says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Because if you want to save your life, uh, he says, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. It's going to be buried in Jesus. But whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same will save it. So, um, to follow Jesus means to deny yourself. It means to, I really want to do this. And it may be a good thing or a bad thing, but Jesus says, not right now. Do this instead. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So, um, Revelation 14, the first angel says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, I've said it before in many sermons, but this phrase here in the second part of the first angel's message is an, is an almost direct quote from the Sabbath commandment. So part of God's will is obedience to the Sabbath commandment. And why does God make such a big deal out of the Sabbath? Because it's the main commandment that we have chosen to forget in our day. And it's not just Sunday Christians that have done that. Um, it, it's many of us as well. I can't tell you the amount of Adventists I've seen who've gone out to eat on the Sabbath after church. The problem with many of us is we treat Saturday like Sunday. I like the way one pastor said it. He's, he says we keep Sunday on Saturday. In Revelation twenty two fourteen, the Bible says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter in uh, through the gates into the city. So we're seeing this process of sanctification, of trusting God, of of praising God, of thanking God, of, of, of um, obeying God. This, this is all the, the will of God. And, and the problem with these people who were begging for entrance into the New Jerusalem is they wanted credit that they did not earn. Um, what, let me ask you a question. How would you feel, those of you who have had surgery especially, um, if you go into the hospital and you say, Dr. Smith is going to be the one to do the surgery on you, he has no training, but he wants to be a doctor, so he has the lab coat, that's good enough, right? That, that's not how it works, right? You want a doctor who has been thoroughly educated. I'm pretty sure nobody would go to see Susan if all she had was a lab coat and no actual training, right? They go see her because she's tried and true, because she's experienced, because she's trained. The, the same is true for us. God is not going to allow us in heaven if all we have is the appearance of a Christian. The appearance is not what saves you. It, it's the heart being like Jesus. You see, one of our problems is that in the church, sins have become fashionable. They are glossed over and excused. This is Review and Herald. And I'll be happy to share these notes with anybody who wants them. Um, so, Prophets and Kings says it this way. Today there is need of the voice of stern rebuke, for grievous sins have separated the people from God. Infidelity is fast becoming fashionable. In another place, she talks about how many times we, we rebuke and we deal with the obvious sins. You know, if, if we find an elder uh, who has maybe, say, gotten uh, involved in alcohol, maybe he's drinking a six-pack every night or something, that, that's obvious. That's something we're probably going to deal with. Uh, but uh, too often, you know, those who have secret sins are not being dealt with. Because oftentimes, because either we don't know 
or because we tend to look the other way. You know, the sins of pride, the sins of lust, the, the, the sins of covetousness, all these different things. And, and these sins are not only becoming cherished, they're becoming fashionable. In other words, we're endorsing these things. There, there are movements within our church that are saying, it's okay to do this. I've seen more than one Adventist say, it's okay to eat pork chops. Yes, I said Adventists who said this. You know, it's okay that to eat unclean meats because it doesn't matter anymore. It, it's okay to, to listen to, you know, music that doesn't glorify God. It's okay to, to dress like this and, and, to, and to look exactly like the world in our appearance. And, and, and it, it, it really bothers me because the Bible very clearly says, no, it, it's not okay. It's not okay to do these things. It's not okay to make sin fashionable. It's not okay to put this sin up on a pedestal because the majority of the church loves it still. doesn't matter who loves it. It doesn't matter how many people love it. If we're not dealing with sin in the camp, beloved, God's favor does not rest upon us. Revelation 2, verse 17 says this, To him that overcometh, I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, written which no man knows save he that receives it and it's the same word it means rank authority or command of suffering as a christian or character so many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in your authority in your character in your rank or command and jesus says no you didn't you thought you did but no you didn't and in your authority or character or command have we not cast out devils and in your character or authority, have we not done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I want to share with you some definitions from this verse. So um, I can't keep both of these slides up. So if you want to keep your Bible open to Matthew 7, 23, um, whether you got your, 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 your Bible or your phone, either way, just... Uh, it, it would help if you keep uh, your eyes on, on the verse. Matthew seven twenty three. So, definitions. Profess. Profess means to concede, to, to not deny, to acknowledge or, ass or, or give assent to. So what Jesus is saying is not, he, he's not saying, I have made you this way, I, you know. He's saying, yeah, I, I don't know you. It's an admission of fact. It's a simple admission of fact. Jesus is conceding. Really what he doesn't want to, but what we've given him no choice to do, he's, he's, yeah, I don't know you. I'm sorry, I, I don't know you. And, and, and Jesus, um, I never knew you. Never, never at any time, not at all. Um, you, you know, oftentimes we, we tend to use hyperbole as an exaggeration. We say, this never happens. When it happens all the time, we just don't realize it. Um, but Jesus is saying, I, I didn't know you ever. You didn't ever come to me that, 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 that I could give you life. And, and the word know means to come to know or become acquainted with. Jesus says, you never gave me the chance to get to know you. The word for work, you that work iniquity. Now, this is an interesting word because notice what I have put here. It's a present active participle. For, for the people in here who are, who are English nerds, present active participle means ongoing action. It's like driving, working, you know, that I-N-G ending on a verb. Um, it means work, exercise, perform, produce, cause to exist, or to work for. I find these words fascinating in the context of this verse. Remember, it says, you that work iniquity. So you're not only working iniquity, you're performing it. You're producing it, Okay. I work at my job servicing porta potties Monday through Friday, but I don't build them. You know, you understand the difference? I'm not building them. Um, Jesus is saying, you guys are producing iniquity. You're not just working it, you're producing it. You're causing it to exist. These sins that didn't exist over here, you guys caused those to exist. He's saying to, to them in, in, to the, in, in the future in the lake of fire. You know, being without law, iniquity, lawlessness. You that work lawlessness or iniquity, Jesus is saying, you are without law. And, and notice this, this 
bought right here in the bottom left corner, contempt for the law. Jesus is saying, depart from me, you that have contempt for the law. It's, it, we're not just producing iniquity. Jesus is telling the wicked, you hate my law. I couldn't save you. I couldn't get to know you because you hate my law. You have contempt for my law. What do they do to those who are guilty of contempt in court? They take them away, right? What makes us think we'll have any less? In Matthew 24, verses, we'll start in verse 4. It says, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my what? My name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And I believe this is the same word. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For, um, I lost my spot. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. <clears throat> and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and shall, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Those of us who remain faithful to Jesus through all this time, all this craziness that is going on in the world, Jesus is saying, because you're remaining faithful, they're, they're going to they're gonna arrest you. They're going to torture you. They're going to afflict you and put, give you, put you in, in pain, both mental and physical and emotional. You're going to be hated by everyone. I don't, during this uh, pandemic, um, especially in the beginning, I saw people stop going to church. And for a time, that, that was necessary to kind of try to curve things, right? But eventually, it became a little bit clear who was simply using the pandemic as an excuse to stop going to church altogether. You probably saw it too. I know I did. And so, um, the, Jesus is, you know, he's saying these things are going to happen, but stay faithful. He that shall endure to the end will be saved, remember? Continuing on. And then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus is talking a lot about the church here. He's talking about things that are going on in the church and in the world in Matthew 24. But notice what he's saying here is, is that many false prophets shall arise. Do prophets talk to the world or to those who believe in God or profess to believe in God? Prophets talk to those who profess to believe in God, whether false or true prophets. In the days of Jeremiah, you had false prophets prophesying to Israel. And so um, the iniquity shall, because iniquity shall abound in the church, the love of many will grow cold. In the church and in the world, I believe. But we're talking about in the, in the church in this message this morning. Because many of us are cherishing sin, whether openly or, or privately, or secretly, where nobody else knows, or maybe a few knows, or everybody knows, people are going to see it, people are going to notice that there's something different, and they're going to say, this person claims to be a Christian, but there's something off. I might not be able to put my finger on it, but I just, I get a bad feeling about them, and because they claim to be a Christian, and I don't want that, I'm, I'm not going to do it. But see, the problem is that many of us are sending so many people to hell, and we don't even realize it because of our behavior, because of the sins that we're cherishing. But Jesus is saying to those, he that, endure, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. That those who, despite of, in spite of everything that's going on in the world, in spite of everything that's going on in the church, he who endures it all, the same shall be saved. You know, um, I can kind of relate to because I've been in situations many times in my life where, where I've seen people who claim to be Christian and they act the exact opposite and you know what and, and my thought at the time was if, if that's a Christian that, if that's what God's like I want no part of it you know they exist they exist everywhere they exist in many churches prophets and kings page 141 says when will the voice of faithful rebuke be heard once more in the church it's not that I have to go up to each and every one of you and say, you should stop doing this sin. You need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. It's not that I need to go with the Bible and, and you know, beat you over the head with it because that's not going to work. We need to follow the example of Jesus in dealing with sin. And how did he deal with it? Privately if he could, but publicly if he had to. When 
if you get the chance, read Matthew 23 later and read the, the accompanying um, commentary in the Desire of Ages on that chapter. What happened in Matthew 23? This is what we call the chapter of the woes, right? The woes chapter. This is where Jesus was saying, woe unto the Pharisees, to the Sadducees. To, and he did this publicly. And, and what the Desire of Ages says about it is particularly interesting because she says that while he was calling down these scathing rebukes upon the, the religious leaders, there were tears in his voice as he did so. I'm not just going to go to um, uh, any of you and say, you need to stop doing this or you're going to hell. And look, this is what the Bible says. I really don't want to see you in hell. I would like to see you in heaven. Will you please consider? Please consider this. Um, in fact, uh, I forgot to put this quote in here, which is fine. It's a little long, but um, Ellen White, when she had a vision in the early days of her ministry, God would give her visions to go and talk to certain people. And she would talk to them, but she would water it down. She would soften the message. And, and when God gave her no command to do that, and he gave her another vision. And in that vision, she saw a group of people with dirty clothes with bloodstains on those clothes, and they would come up to her, and they would rub their bloodstains on her clothes. And, and then she saw Jesus, and he simply frowned and turned around. And she says at that moment she understood what the wicked will feel, having lost the favor of God. And it was because she wasn't delivering the message as she was supposed to. Now, um, after that, you know, she was, you know, completely repented of that sin. And so the, when, when we deal with it in the church, it needs to be dealt with just as faithfully. Um, Prophets and Kings, page 141, says... This is speaking of the story of um, David and uh, Nathaniel. Nathan, I think. Uh, Nathan told David, you are the man. Words as unmistakably plain as these spoken by Nathan to David are seldom heard in the pulpits of today, seldom seen in the public press. If they were not so rare, we should see more of the power of God revealed among men. The Lord's messengers should not complain that their efforts are without fruit until they repent of their own love of approbation and their desire to please men, which leads them to suppress the truth. Too many of our leaders are people pleasers. That's why our churches aren't growing. That's one reason why our churches aren't growing very quickly, many of them. In fact, many of the churches are shrinking. There, there, there are a sad number of churches that have had to close their doors. I remember going to the constituency conference meeting last year with uh, Alex and uh, who else? I don't remember who else was there. Um, yeah, I think Charles was there. There was somebody else I went with that I can't remember who it was. Alive to Christ. You see, if God dealt severely, so severely with an entire nation, the nation of Israel, because of that one man, Achan, what makes us think that he will deal with us any differently? Has God changed? Many of us act like he has, though. We act like he doesn't deal with sin the way that he did back then. We act like he doesn't care about sin anymore. We, act, we come to church and we act like God doesn't really care about this thing. Nobody else knows, so I think it'll be okay. You know, And, and many of us, if not all of us, have these different secret cherished sins that, that, that we need to give up. And so, um, in, in testimonies to the church, where the same danger exists today, she says. You know, they are too apt to flatter themselves that, that the regard in which they hold the commandments will preserve them from the divine power, from the power of divine justice. They refuse to be reproved for evil. A sin hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. Does it say that God hates some sin? God hates all sin. And why does he hate it? Does he hate us? No, of course not. He hates sin because of what it does to us. That's why his messages in the Bible are so pointed and so, seem so severe. In, in, in fact, this, you know, if you have the Remnant Study Bible, I, I think it's, look in Matthew and the different quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy that the Remnant Study Bible puts in there. I think it's in there. And she talks about how the reason 
that, 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 that some of these messages exist in the Bible so pointedly is because some, for some people, for some of us, there is no other way to, to arouse us back to life, to arouse us back to um, spiritual life. In fact, um, in the Bible, wind is symbolic for what in prophecy? What's that? Not the spirit, but like in end time prophecy, wind symbolizes often strife, hard times. In Ezekiel 37, what did God do to wake up that valley of dry bones to bring them back to life? He breathed on them. The, the only way he could wake them up was to give them hard times. And sadly, with many of us, it's the same thing. See, neglect to repent, this is from testimonies as well, neglect to repent and obey his word will bring as serious consequences upon God's people today as did the same, same sin upon ancient Israel. There is a limit beyond which he will no longer delay his judgments. The desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning before the eyes of modern Israel that the corrections given through his chosen instruments cannot be regard, disregarded with impunity. There, see, there, there are evils in the church today that, that were in Israel back then. There are evils in the church today that would make the worldlings blush. You ever heard the phrase, uh, making a, I think it was something like making a sailor blush? You, you cuss so much, you make a sailor blush. And that's because sailors have a reputation for, for very foul language. And, and so these sins have to be dealt with. And, and if, if the sinner refuses to repent, then, then we need to follow the process of Matthew 18. Not because we want them to leave the church, but because we want them to wake up to their need of salvation. And, and when we properly deal with sin in the church, these people, many of them, will return. The churches who are experiencing exponential growth are the churches who are properly dealing with sin among their members. They're not afraid to go to this person over here and say, look, this, this that you're doing, that the Bible says you can't do that. That's a sin. You need to repent of that. And if they refuse to repent, the church follows the process of Matthew 18. And, 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 and if, if need be, up to the point of, of disfellowship. Not, not because we want them out, but because we want them saved. So, um, if all these things are what God's character is not, what is God's character? And if name is character, what is God's name? In Isaiah 33, the Bible says this, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walks righteously those who speak uprightly, those who despise the gain of oppressions, you know, extortion, you know, making money at the expense of others, those who shake his hands from holding bribes. In other words, you see bribes and you refuse to take part of it. Those who stop his ears from hearing of blood and shut his eyes from seeing evil. Um, most of the entertainment on TV and movies, on the Internet, and even TikTok and Instagram and all those things, are, are videos that, uh, that, that, that portray violence, that portray you know, bloodshed and evil things. And the Bible is saying that those who dwell with God for eternity will be those who stopped taking those things in. In Romans 1, Romans 1 equates those who, who take pleasure in watching these things as being on the same level of wickedness as those who do these things. Um, in Isaiah, uh, continuing on, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. The, your eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. So, in, you know, in, in this text in Isaiah, God is letting us know the character of those who will be with him for eternity. And God's name is also his law. For example... It's cut off a little on that side, but that's okay. I can, I can send the picture to anybody who wants it. Um, in the Bible, the God is described as all these things in the center, and his law as described is all these things in the center. So God's law is his character. God is not 
asking us to do anything that he himself would not do, or he would not ask us to be a, way, a certain way that he himself is not already. In Mark 12, verses 30 to 31, the Bible says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, like it. Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none other commandment greater than these. In another place in the Gospels, Jesus says that upon um, these hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, um, the Ten Commandments are about love. Love to God primarily and then love to each other. If I, if I love my fellow brothers in here, I'm not going to go flirt with their wives. You know what I mean? Um, and, and we'll talk about uh, a little bit more in depth in, in a few minutes. But it, it's, it's all about love. And, and the Bible, which is all the prophets, is all about love. Romans, you know, and, and many, many people say, you need to preach love. You need to preach Jesus. You know, all these hard messages, all these not fun messages, that's not love. And I say hogwash, that is love. When you do it in the spirit of Christ, it absolutely is love. Because if all the Bible falls under these two commandments, love God, love your neighbor, then all these pointed messages in the Bible are because God loves us. In fact, what did Jesus say in Revelation chapter uh, 3 to the Laodicean church? As many as I what? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Romans 13 says it this way, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, with this in mind, how is love the fulfilling of the law in terms of God's name or his character? So let's uh, go through each of the commandments. You know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time for the sake of time. Commandment number one says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If we love God, we're not going to be worshiping other gods. And, and this could be your phone. It could be your computer. It could be your job. It could be money. It could be anything. You're, if you love God, you're not going to worship anything else besides God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. If we love God, we're not going to make idols. You know, um, there are many people who have idols in their house, and these are, these are Christian people. And many of them are doing the best that they can, but they have these idols in their house, and they say, well, this is just to help me worship God better. If you read Patriarchs and Prophets, the, she says, this was also the attitude of many of the antediluvians. They had these idols, and their, their excuse was, it just helps me worship God better. But God says, don't do that. Don't make these idols. And if we love God, we're going to obey that command. Thou shalt... Not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. See, if we love God, we're not going to speak or live in a way that dishonors him, either privately or publicly. When I taught at the academy there in Jefferson for a couple of years, one thing that I told my student is, students uh, is that everything we do, everything, has an influence on others. The way we put on our socks in the morning or brush our teeth, everything has an influence on others. We are either a saver of life unto life, the Bible says, or of death unto death. And if we love God, then not taking his name in vain means speaking with pure speech. It means living in a way that honors him. It's not just using your words. You know, it's not just avoiding, you know, foul language. It's avoiding foul lifestyle. To, to take the name of the Lord in vain is disobedience to his law, quite simply. The Bible goes on in Exodus 20, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is the longest commandment of the four. If we love God, we're going to want to spend uninterrupted time with Him on His holy day. We're not going to want to do our own pleasure on His holy day. Tomorrow is Mother's Day, right? Who are we honoring that day? Well, 
Hopefully God. But other than that, <laughs> mothers, if you're a mother in this sanctuary, tomorrow is, is your day. Uh, you, you know, many of us will take our, our wives and mothers out to eat. Many of us will get them gifts. And um, we're not going to make, you know, if we're good fathers, we're not going to make Mother's Day all about us, right? It's not my day. It's, it's hers. It's Mother's Day. It's not Father's Day. The Sabbath is, 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 is that, but so much more eternally important. Today is God's day. When I leave here from church, I'm not going to drive up to Texarkana and go service porta potties because it's God's day. You know, and, and, and the problem with the thinking that Sunday is the Sabbath is many people will go to church Sunday morning and then they'll go to Applebee's for lunch and then they'll go to work after that. You know, I've, I've talked to people who, who used to live like that. And so, and, and, and so if we love God, we're not going to treat the Sabbath like that. The fifth commandment says, Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. If we love God and each other, we're going to treat our parents and authority figures in a way that honors God and the value that he has placed upon them. I believe this commandment is far more, has far more depth than what we read into it, than what we read it with. Because you see, the Bible commands us to treat each other like family, does it not? Treat the older men as fathers, Paul says. Treat the older women as mothers. Treat each other as what? Brothers and sisters. So, um, and, and, and for the leaders of our church as well, you have three elders here. You have Pastor Ernesto, you have the head deacon and the head of this department and, and different departments. And God is saying, honor these people. Honor them because if you honor them, God will give you a full life. It may not be the life you expected, but God will bless your life. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Now, I hope this is an obvious one. But if we love God and each other, we're not going to take each other's lives. We're, we're not going to either physically or mentally. How many of you have been so angry with a person that you wish that if I could just get them in private, if I could get away with it, man, the things I would do to them. If we love God, that's not going to be our mindset. You see, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that just because you don't physically commit murder, if you're thinking it in your head, you're as guilty as if you would have done it already. All that prevents is lack of opportunity. And when you think about it and you see the prison systems, there are people in prison who, who have done that. They thought they could get away with it, and so they did it, and then they paid the price for it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. If we love God and each other, we're not going to seek romantic interests in others. And notice what we put there, either in person or on a screen. There, there are many people who they don't have the spine to go out and, and cheat on their spouse physically, but they'll look at a computer screen or a phone screen all day long. Um, and Jesus, again, same thing with murder. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that, if you look at somebody else to lust on them in your heart, you're as guilty as, you have, as if you had physically done the act. Whether they were married or taken, Jesus is saying, if you're not married to them and you lust after them, you've committed adultery. You can, we continue in the commandments that says, Thou shalt not steal. If I love you, if I love God, I'm not going to take your stuff. I'm not going to go to your house and say, Ooh, I like this. I'm going to take this. It's not like we have these resources out in the hallway, in the foyer, that say, for people to take because we want them to, right? We want them to take those Bible studies, those books, those flyers. We, 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 want, we want people to have those. But what if I came in here and I took that fancy little live stream camera? You know, that's theft. That's stealing. The Bible says, no, don't do that. Um, continuing in the commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Quite simply, dishonesty. And dishonesty has a depth to it that is far deeper than I think many of us realize. If, if we love God, if we love each other, I'm not going to lie to you about somebody else. I'm not going to smear their reputation. I'm not going to say, hey, did you hear about this person and what they did? Um, I, I'm, even if they deserve it. You know, I used to live in a rumor mill, and I tell you, I hated it. 
because that's not Christian. Christians don't go around smearing each other. Christians don't go around being dishonest about each other. And let me broaden it to say that Christians don't go around smearing the politicians that they hate. Let me be so bold as to say that if you're smearing President Biden, whether you like him or not, you're not a Christian. If you did the same thing to Trump, you're not a Christian. Why do I say that? Christians don't do that. And, and, and furthermore, for Adventists, we've been counseled to stay away from politics. Those of us who are getting involved in it, those of us who are endorsing certain political candidates, we need to repent of that sin. You know, so the fact that many of us do those things, it, it's a problem, and we need to stop. The Tenth Commandment says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, his wife, his servants, his, his livestock, or anything that is your neighbor's. I have friends with cool things. I have friends with property that I would love to live on. And the Bible says, if you covet their, their stuff, that's a sin, that's a problem. Coveting is when you want something else that belongs to somebody else to the point where if the opportunity presents itself, you're going to steal it. And, and even if you never have the opportunity to physically do it, if it's in your mind, you've already done it. You're already guilty of it. And, and if I love you, if I love God, I'm not going to treat you like that. If you love God and me, you're not going to treat me like that. You see, James chapter 2, verse 10 says it this way. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And why is that? Well, hopefully because we've already seen that the same principle of love runs through every single commandment. The principle of love is the very fabric and DNA of the Ten Commandments. And because of that, I can, I can avoid making an idol. But if when I get home, I look on my phone screen at women who don't belong to me, I've broken the whole law. I know, you guys know I used to have that problem. Matthew 7, let's, let's go back here, and we're going to read a little bit further. We're going to read the beginning text again, and we're going to read a little bit further after that. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. It's not enough to want to go to heaven. We need to be doing God's will. And we're not going to do God's will if we don't have his character in our hearts. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Remember, that means authority or character. And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess or simply concede the point to them, I, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Can you imagine? And, you know, I've, I've, I've heard this verse quoted, uh, what Jesus says here, quoted in an angry tone many times. I've done it that way many times. But I think the way, personally, I believe the way that Jesus is going to be saying this is, look, guys, I hate to do this. I think there's going to be tears in his voice and tears on his face. You guys got to leave. I don't know you. You guys are workers of lawlessness. I, you have to. You gave me no choice. Therefore, he continues, uh, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon, uh, upon a rock. And the rain descended... And the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. So, this is, you know, there's a popular children's song about this. The wise man built his house upon the what? Upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the what? What is common, a common characteristic of a rock? Solid. Does it change? Not very quickly. <laughs> but big rocks, mountains, they, they typically don't change. At least for the example, you know, in the Bible, they don't change. Jesus is symbolized by the rock. He's symbolized by a mountain. He doesn't change. If we build upon the foundation, the rock that is Jesus, your house will not be swept away when the tempests of the time of trouble begin. And hard as they may try, as hard as they may beat upon your house that is built upon the rock, it will not fall. But Jesus continues and says that the foolish man 
built his house on the sand. What is, what is known about sand? Is it, is it solid? It shifts. The, the, the ocean comes, ebbs and flows, and eventually that changes the shape of the beach. It changes the slope, you know. Um, and and, and sand, if you build a sand castle, okay, if, if, a, if, a, if a water twister, a water spout, whatever they're called, comes, is that sand castle going to survive? Not at all. If the waves come, is that sand castle going to survive? Not at all. And, and so, and what's interesting is that in the Bible, Jesus is called the water of life. Jesus will allow us to be tested here soon. This pandemic has shown many of us our true characters, right? From spiritual gifts, um, many who had professed to be Christ followers, but who had not honored God in their lives, they enumerate their good deeds performed by them when they lived on earth, and they entreat to be admitted to the city. They plead that their names were on the church books, and they had prophesied in the name of Christ, and in his name cast out devils and done many wonderful works. Christ answers, your cases have been decided. Your names are not found enrolled in the book of life. You profess to believe in my name, but you trampled upon the law of God. I know you not. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Satan and his angels try to encourage the wicked multitude to actions, but fire descends from heaven and unites uh, with the fire in heaven and aids in the general conflagration. Men and women professing godliness and expecting translation to heaven without seeing death, I warn you to be less greedy of gain, less self-caring. Redeem your godlike manhood, your noble womanhood, by noble acts of disinterested benevolence. Heartily despise your formal avaricious spirit and regain true nobility of soul. From what God has shown me, unless you zealously repent, Christ will spew you out of his mouth. Sabbath-keeping Adventists profess to be followers of Christ, but the works of many of them belie their profession. You shall know them by their fruits. Everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Revelation 22, verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. In closing, I want to ask, what will your reward be? Will he know your name? Sir? Yeah. But our question is, you know, will we be Will he know our character in the book of life, you know? Um, does somebody have a bulletin what our closing hymn is? Four, 460? 416. All right. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. Oh, look at that. Does anybody know how to work this thing? <laughs> 